Ethiopia's prime minister reaches a deal with soldiers demanding raises. The tug of war between Washington and Beijing to be the top economic player in Africa. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Ebola outbreak spreads to the northeastern city of Beni. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We'll have those stories in a moment. But first, we begin with a massive loss of life uh, from flooding across much of central and southern Nigeria. The death toll has now reached 199, according to the nation's National Disaster Agency. The nearly annual floods exacerbated by poor infrastructure and lack of planning to protect against inundation are the worst since 2012, when at least 363 people died. Nigeria's National Emergency Management Agency says this year, floods have hit one-third of Nigeria's 36 states since late August, affecting almost 2 million people and displacing over 560,000. The country's rainy season is now nearing an end, but flood waters could take time to recede while humanitarian needs are pro uh, pressing and disease such as cholera are a major uh, risk at the moment. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed met Wednesday with several hundred soldiers who had marched on his office to demand pay raises and were invited in to see him. According to his office and state media, Abiy listened to their grievances, carefully reprimanded them for the wrong procedure they followed to express those grievances, but concluded the meeting with a promise to meet properly in the near future to positively consider their demands. In addition to asking pay, uh, for pay raises, the soldiers asked the Prime Minister to review the structure and operations of the military. Abiy 42 took office in April after several years of unrest forced his uh, predecessor, Haile Mariam Dessalang, to resign. He has pledged to reform the security forces and promote multi-party democracy. These changes are a shock to the system in Ethiopia, a country of more than 100 million people that has tolerated little dissent since the ruling Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front coalition seized power in 1991. Now, Washington and Beijing are both vying to be the top economic player in Africa. China is pouring billions of dollars in infrastructure projects and foreign aid in an attempt to woo the continent's growing economies, while some say the United States is lagging behind in that effort. On well, this week's Plugged In with Greta Van Susteren, USAID's Mark Green lays out the United States' approach to leveling the playing field with China. VOA's Jesusame Oni has more. Africa home to some of the world's fastest growing economies, has caught the eye of investors around the globe, particularly Beijing, which has showered the continent with billions of dollars in loans and new infrastructure projects, including Kenya's railway, the Madaraka Express. China is trying to position itself to take advantage of economic growth opportunities in, in Africa. China pledging to do even more through its Belt and Road Initiative, a trillion dollar plan to finance and build railroads, ports, roads and other huge projects in nearly 70 countries. Critics, however, warn that China is luring African countries into a debt trap, lending them money that may be too difficult to repay. They build dependency. So the choice is self-reliance versus almost servitude. What they do are uh, loans, uh, and as we're learning more and more often, unsustainable financing that uh, mortgages a country's future. USAID Administrator Mark Green tells VOA contributor Greta Van Susteren the U.S. approach is different. We ask for our reforms. We ask them to respect certain rights and values. Uh, what we want for them is to become eventually trading partners, but, but equal partners. China has pushed back on the criticism, saying it's about development. They do, you know, make the argument that there's no political strings attached, that we're not going to ask you to change your uh, political system or to adopt our values. But as we've seen in instances already with the way that China has handled its relationships with other countries, 
uh, that it's going to be asking. At some point down the line, that's going to become an issue, and it will ask uh, other countries to toe the line. Some worry the effects of China's methods go even beyond the heavy debt burdens. What China's doing is also enabling corruption in these countries, where uh, the African elite or governments are really uh, making backdoor kickbacks, uh, backdoor agreements and opaque agreements that are not really uh, privy to uh, kind of uh, transparent uh, interactions. U.S. lawmakers, in part responding to China's growing influence in Africa, have passed legislation known as the Build Act, which would set up an agency to help the U.S. invest more in the continent. Experts say it could give the U.S. a boost in the tug of war with Beijing over Africa. Jay Suseme Oni, VOA News, Washington. Britain's Prince William said on Thursday it was heartbreaking that his children might not see elephants, rhinos and tigers in the wild. He urged an international conference in London to tackle the illegal wildlife trade. He said he was not willing to look his children in the eye and tell them his generation allowed for the extinction of animals to take place. The Duke of Cambridge was delivering a speech during the fourth illegal wildlife trade conference, a two-day event hosted by the British government. The conference aims to eradicate illegal wildlife trade by bringing together political leaders, businesses and conservation groups according to the British government. Prince William also told the conference about his September visit to Namibia, Tanzania and Kenya as part of a tour to learn more about wildlife conservation in Africa. This is a global summit because the urgent challenge of the illegal wildlife trade is one we face as a global community. This crime continues to hamper sustainable development, undermine the rule of law, and deprive local communities of some of their most valuable natural resources. And of course, it threatens some of the world's most iconic species with the very real prospect of extinction from the wild. Action is required now. It is only by putting together across charities, industries, and government agencies, as well as across borders and continents, that we will truly succeed in ending this senseless crime. Well, the Prince is the president of United for Wildlife, which fights illegal trade in wildlife and patron of TASC, an, organi an organization that prom uh, promotes conservation. Well, U.S. President Donald Trump and his Turkish counterpart, uh, President Recep Erdogan, are under increasing pressure to get an explanation from Saudi Arabia about the disappearance of uh, uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who disappeared on October 2nd after entering the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul. Turkish investigators have concluded that Khashoggi is dead. The Saudi government is suspected of either kidnapping or assassinating him for his criticism of the royal dynasty. But Saudi officials deny any involvement in his disappearance. Viewers Ladit Zahouk reports. Activists gathered outside the Saudi embassy in Washington on Wednesday, demanding answers about Khashoggi's disappearance and expressing suspicion that he was killed on the order of Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. President Trump said he had spoken with the Saudis about what he called a bad situation. Well, I have to find out who did it, but uh, people saw him go in, but they didn't see him come out, as they understand it. And we're going to take a very serious look at it. It's a terrible thing. U.S. lawmakers on both sides of the aisle say if the Saudis are responsible for Hashoggi's disappearance, the Trump administration would have to act. This hangs over the relationship like a very heavy cloud and uh, I've been very supportive of Saudi Arabia. They've been a good ally in sharing intelligence and we're facing common enemies in Iran and <clears throat> radical Sunni Islam. If Saudi Arabia took a U.S. resident, lured him into a consulate and killed him, it's time for the United States to rethink our military, political uh, and economic relationship with Saudi Arabia. Erdogan is under similar pressure from his supporters and opponents. I don't think the Saudis understand this isn't Kuwait, this isn't Jordan, this isn't the UAE where they pull this kind of stunt. This is a, a country with a very specific history and doesn't like foreign countries coming here and pulling an operation like this. Turkish media report that a 15-member Saudi squad landed in Turkey last week and killed and dismembered the journalist. Such a brazen act is seen as a challenge to Erdogan's authority. But it could also spell embarrassment for Trump. 
U.S. Democratic Congressman Jerry Connolly spoke to VOA's Turkish service. In his almost naive embrace of the uh, Saudi system and Saudi leadership, uh, when he was feted with uh, great ceremony and uh, very lavish uh, events on his first overseas trip, which was to Saudi Arabia, uh, I think he may have un unwittingly led the Crown Prince to believe that the relationship would be one in which there would be no accountability of Saudi behavior. Hashoki has lived in the United States since last year and has been writing for the Washington Post. Zlarica Hok, VOA News, Washington. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, the latest on the Ebola outbreak and the DRC. But first, a look at Thursday's headlines. In Kenya, evicted residents demand compensation after the Kenya Four Power Company turned acres of residents' land into an open cast mine but did not pay compensation, saying that the government had acquired the land in the 1970s. In Indonesia, the World Bank has dropped its 2018 economic growth forecast for sub Saharan Africa, partly blaming sluggish growth in some of the region's bigger economies and the increasing risks in the international economic environment due to the US China trade war. In Mozambique, Andre Magibire of the Renamo opposition party says the incumbent Frelimo party did not conduct fair elections. Former Ivorian international football player Bonaventure Kalou has launched a career as a politician running for mayor in his hometown of Vavoua. Well, it's time for our health report and joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu with the latest news on youth and mental health. Lino. Each year, World Mental Health Day is observed on October 10th to raise awareness of mental health issues around the world and mobilizing efforts in support of mental health. This year's observance has focused on young people. The World Health Organization says half of all cases of mental illness begin by the age of 14, but most cases go undetected or untreated. Worldwide, it's estimated that 10 to 20 percent of adolescents experience mental health conditions. Suicide is the second leading cause of death globally among 15 to 29 year olds, and depression is the third leading cause of mental illness among young people. The WHO says, among other things, investment by governments and the involvement of the social, health, and education sectors in comprehensive, integrated, evidence based program for the mental health of young people is essential. Now, the Democratic Republic of Congo's Ebola outbreak is expected to last a few more months. That's according to the World Health Organization. The WHO's emergency response chief, Peter Salama, says the most concerning area is the northeastern city of Beni in North Kivu province, where dozens of people who may have been exposed to the deadly disease are hiding from health workers. The outbreak has now caused 194 cases and 122 deaths. Two-thirds of cases in the past month have been in and around Beni. Authorities say local mistrust and attacks by rebel groups have disrupted treatment and vaccination programs. They worry that without the cooperation of the local population, they will have difficulty containing it. Joining us now from New York is Dr. Mesfin Teklu Tesema, Senior Director of the Health Unit with the International Rescue Committee. Dr. Tesema, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Lenard. The International Rescue Committee is um, present on the ground in the GRC to help contain the epidemic. What is your assessment of the situation? Yeah, the, uh, the situation in DRC, still the outbreak is going on, and uh, both uh, North Kivu and Ituri provinces are the center of the outbreak. 
even the outbreak is expanding actually uh, closer to the border with Uganda. So, uh, you know, the number of cases still continue to increase and uh, so many cases are being investigated. So we are still in the middle of it. So um, we are really working hard to contain this outbreak. So the WHO sounded the alarm through Peter Salama saying that this may take a few more months to contain it. What is your uh, reaction? Uh, is it as dire as it is? Uh, I agree with Dr. Salama's assessment of the current situation. Um, we are really a situation where we don't have actually, um, uh, a, you know, view of all the cases, and um, you know, we still continue to see a sporadic case of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, new cases coming to uh, our attention. So, uh, even uh, in a best case scenario where you are able to track every case. You should be able to monitor all the contact and the contact of the contact. And because of the situation in North Kivu, which is, um, you know, uh, complicated by conflict and in some areas where communities are not necessarily cooperating. So uh, we are really anticipating that this outbreak may not go away very soon. But, uh, you know, one thing is that we are working hard, actually, just to contain. And working hard, what is the uh, IRC doing, uh, particularly? So the International Rescue Committee, we've been working in North Kivu even before the current outbreak and providing health care. Uh, so at the moment, we are supporting nearly 52 health facilities really to improve their infection prevention control capacity. That means, you know, uh, their ability to detect uh, case, isolate and refer safely and just to make sure that health facilities are not a place for transmission of the virus. So uh, we are, um, you know, uh, ensuring that those health facilities are adequately uh, equipped, you know, to, uh, uh, you know to, to contain the virus. So that's what we are uh, currently doing. At the same time, of course, we are supporting community outreach in terms of um, identifying and bringing new cases where uh, those cases need to be treated. So there are reports also of community lack of trust. What is the problem? What are communities, uh, uh, why do they seem to have very little trust uh, through health workers and international groups that are uh, providing assistance? You know, there are many reasons. I think uh, by, you know, mostly majority of communities are collaborating with us. Uh, but there are some pocket areas of mistrust and partly because misinformation about the outbreak and in a sense that, you know, this outbreak has high mortality rate and uh, some communities are refusing uh, to take the sick in, to be treated in the Ebola treatment center. So uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, the information that's not necessarily, uh, you know, being disseminated and, um, you know, some misinformation that we know uh, is not helping, you know, community to understand the risk. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, we are experiencing pushback from some communities. But it is not everywhere. I think there are some only pocket areas. Okay. And before we wrap Dr. Tesema, there are more tools this time around. DRC has experienced some, some outbreaks in the past with uh, success in terms of containment. So there are more tools, but this seems to be more difficult. How do we move forward? Where do we focus uh, to ensure that things get in, into, under control? I think we should still continue to enhance our surveillance and monitor um, uh, you know, the communities. So every case detected, we should be able to uh, trace every contact and the contact of the contact. And at this time, we have also a new tool, which is a vaccine, uh, which is really enabling us to contain the virus. And it has been proven successful in the western part of the uh, recent outbreak. So uh, in, enhancing the surveillance and in, uh, ensuring that you know, clear message are reaching to the communities and uh, just continue to improve the infection uh, control at the health facilities and uh, uh, ensuring that, you know, dead, uh, dead bodies are properly and safely buried. Uh, so there are a range of things that we are already doing. We need to intensify those activities. Okay. But we also need cooperation from the 
uh, you know, government, international community, really to have peace uh, and safe access to areas where uh, conflict and uh, active, uh, you know, uh, violence is happening. Okay, Dr. Tesema, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. And that was uh, Dr. Mesfin Teklu Tesema. He is uh, the health, uh, head of health unit at the International Rescue Committee. Now, very often babies are born after nine months, but some babies are born prematurely. Some of the smallest premature babies weigh under 1,500 grams. These tiny babies, called micropremies, cannot afford to lose any weight. At the Children's National Medical Center here in Washington, D.C., a team of specialists has developed a plan to give these babies the best chance to thrive. We get more from VOA's Carol Pearson. When J.C. was born, he weighed just a little more than 736 grams. But look at him now. He no longer looks like the micro preemie he once was. I was so scared to touch him at first, and he was so small, and I couldn't even change his diaper. I was so nervous and anxious. He just looked so frail. And, but um, the nurses were very supportive and encouraging. J.C. was born at just 24 weeks. Full-term babies are born between 39 and 40 weeks. We're going to do an EKG this morning because of the PBCs. A team of specialists at the NICU, the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, wanted to see if they could help JC and other very small preterm babies boost their weight and improve their chances to thrive. Preemies in particular have a high incidence of malnutrition as well as poor development. In your belly, okay? These babies okay. have so little body fat, they can't afford to waste energy. Some are in blanketed incubators to encourage sleep. The team focused on what and when the babies ate. We noticed that a lot of our practitioners um, and the way that they were um, providing feedings for our very low birth weight babies, so those are babies that were born 1,500 grams or less. They're being fed all kinds of um, different varying ways. Good job, pump it, Mom. Okay. <laughs> impressive. They wanted to make sure all babies were getting the same care to boost calories and improve their nutrition. Wherever possible, the team emphasized mother's milk. That is the, um, what's best for the premature babies. Um, they tolerate it better, has great antibodies. We know that mother's milk has growth factors in it uh, that can't be replaced with any other substance. I just kind of separate it to make sure that I have all of the batch numbers. The team standardized nutrition practices. They can include fortified donor breast milk for babies whose mothers can't provide their own, or fortified mother's milk, or formula depending on each baby's needs. I'm very pleased. Um, I'm, we have been able to put protocols in place um, so that there's a standardization of care um, for these babies and uh, the feeding aspect. Um, we've also increased the amount of mother's own milk we've been providing for the babies, which is great. We were able to improve their weight by 30 percent. The team isn't done yet. They want to tweak the nutrition practices to see if they can improve their results. Once they're finished, They'll publish the results so other micro preemies can benefit too. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Mudu. Vincent, back to you. Well, thanks a lot, Lenore. And I'll be sure to watch Lenore Mudu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday, right here on Africa 54. And here's what's trending. In Tanzania's Gurumeti Game Reserve next to Serengeti's National Park, elephants roam, rangers sleep more peacefully at night, and poachers have been put on notice thanks to new technology designed to protect one of the world's most endangered species. U.S. philanthropist and Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen's company Vulcan have developed Earth Ranger to help. The tech platform that aggregates remote sensor readings of animal movements, trackers on radios and vehicles, camera trap photos and data from GPS-powered geofences 
to give rangers in wildlife reserves and park, uh, parks such as Grimeti a clear view of protected areas. The platform alerts them when threats are picked up through uh, the data. Well, and in other Silicon Valley news, Google is shutting down its plus social network for consumers following its disclosure of a flaw discovered in March that could have exposed some personal information of up to 500,000 people. Google disclosing the problem at the time in part to avoiding drawing regulatory uh, scrutiny and damaging its reputation. That's according to Wall Street Journal story that cited anonymous individuals and documents. The Mountain View, California company declined to comment on the journal's report and didn't fully explain in its blog, uh, blog post why it held off on revealing the bug until Monday. And that's what's trending today. Now, Rwandan 27-year-old Asumta Uwamaria has a degree in clinical psychology. When she could not find a job in her field, Uwamaria started growing beetroots and in time realized she could turn this farming venture into a lucrative wine business. Sam Holder of Reuters News Agency has her story. With a university education, Asumpta Uamaria didn't expect to be picking beetroot. But jobs are hard to find in the far west of Rwanda. 25% of people are unemployed. But Asumpta now has an international business, turning beetroot into wine. I realized that there were many people looking for jobs, and there were no jobs. So I started thinking of doing something unique and innovative. So I decided to start farming beetroots. I first started making beetroot juice, but then I met someone online who trained me on how to make beetroot wine. Rwanda is ranked as the fourth best country in the world for gender equality. 30% of businesses are owned by women. The production here may look basic, but Asumpta sells around a thousand bottles every month, employing 17 people. And the Karasimbi wine has fans across the world. I have customers in Congo, Mozambique. I also found out that I have customers in Germany. I don't know how my wine got there, but they told me that they tasted my wine and started ordering from me afterwards. Some of them even came all the way here to see me and buy my wine. Beetroot is a common ingredient in Rwandan cooking, and at $8 a bottle, the rich and earthy wine has become a favorite in bars across the capital Kigali. With Rwandans and seemingly non-Rwandans developing a taste for beetroot wine, Asumpta says she hopes to double production by next year. Well, that report by Sam Holder of news, uh, Reuters News Agency. And that's our show for today. Uh, be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewafrica.com. For more news, tune in to viewers' evening radio show Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the morning, still Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That's Monday through Friday. Thanks so much for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. A lot of American English idioms refer to parts of the body. Get off on the wrong foot. Are Anna and Jonathan having trouble learning a dance? How did it go meeting your girlfriend's family? Well, it was uh, interesting. First, I was really late. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, and then at dinner, I spilled my water all over